Some say the Bible foretells a time when many will vanish into thin air. A time when the world is plunged into seven years of tribulation. But can this really be supported by the Bible? Join us as we take a look at Left Behind, Fact or Fiction. Well, thank you for joining us again. This is our final and last in our six-part series titled Left Behind No More, aired here on Three Angels Broadcasting. I'm Mark Finley of It Is Written Television. The story is told of an Australian lumberman who was out chopping lumber and gathering that wood to build a new fence for a portion of his ranch. As he was walking back, lugging lumber back home, he looked over a hill and saw a puff of smoke on the horizon. Immediately, he thought of his own ranch, and he thought of his own farmhouse and the possibility of his house or barn being on fire. He dropped the lumber and began to run. He ran up one hill and down another and ran across a meadow and through a brook. And when he got back, he noticed that his barn was consumed in smoke. It was just black, charred embers. He was absolutely disgusted, and he was walking through that barn. It, he happened to be a chicken farmer, and he noticed all the dead hen there. And in disgust, as he walked along, he kicked one of the large, one of the large mother hens. And as he kicked that dead hen, all charred in the rubble, four little chicks ran out from mother hen. Mother hen had died, so they could live and. This farmer bent down, and he took those little chicks in his hand, and he looked at them, and he looked at Ma, who had died. What a symbol of protection, what a symbol of security provided for those little hands. And in the last days, God, too, promises that he will be a hiding place for us. As the winds of tempest blow and as the fires of persecution come, as the fires of trial come and as the fires of difficulty come, God does not promise to deliver us from them, but he promises to preserve us in them. Revelation chapter 3, the Bible tells us that Christ himself will prove to be able. Christ himself will prove to be fully capable of protecting us in the greatest fires, three trials of life. Revelation 3, verse 10 says, Because you have kept my commandment to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which is to come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no man may take your crown. Notice what he says. He says, I'm coming quickly. Hold on. Persevere. Don't give up. Then he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial. Now, it doesn't say, I will deliver you from the hour of trial. Some people read this passage and they say, see, we're going to be delivered, whisked away in the rapture before the tribulation. No, he says, I will keep you. To keep means to, pers to preserve. He's going to preserve us through that trial, just like he preserved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, just like he's preserved his people down through the ages. Isaiah chapter 32 tells us about this God who preserves us. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness. Who's that, the king that will reign in righteousness? It's Jesus. And princes will rule with justice. A man shall be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest or the storm as rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Who is the man that is the hiding place from the wind, from every stormy wind that blows from every trial and tempest that blows. There is a place of sure relief. It is with Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is our protector. He is the one that is our refuge. When you think of the coming time of trouble, if you focus too much on the trouble, you have a time of trouble before the time of trouble. If you focus too much on the difficulty, you have a time of difficulty before the difficulty. If you focus too much on the trials, you have a trial before the trial. Rather than focus your attention on all the troubles that are coming, focus them on Jesus. Because Jesus is greater than our troubles. Jesus is greater than our problems. Jesus is greater than the burdens. And in the last days of earth's history, Christ will prov prove fully able to shelter us in those times of trouble. In Revelation chapter 16, the Bible describes that very time of trouble, that very time of tribulation. 
Let's go through it and notice the spiritual principles involved. In Revelation 16, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. Now, let me remind you that the expression, the wrath of God, has to do with the judgments of God. So it's saying, Go and pour the judgments of God upon the earth. God's wrath is not His anger. It's not that He's mad at people. But the wrath of God has to do with God's judgments or justice poured out upon sin. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those that worshipped his image. Now the mark of the beast is the mark of human authority. Remember in Daniel chapter 7, the Bible talked about a power that would attempt to change the very law of God. There was an attempt to change God's law from Saturday, the seventh day Sabbath, to Sunday, the first day. And that became the mark of human authority. Now, I would not want to suggest, and the Bible does not teach, that anybody who worships on the first day of the week has the mark of the beast. The Bible teaches that the mark of the beast is something that will come in the future when church and state unite. Nobody has the mark of the beast today. But when in the full light of all the evidence, in the full light of truth, men and women turn their back on God's law, they will then receive the mark of the beast or they will receive the mark of human authority rather than God's seal, the mark of the Creator's authority. Now, the Bible says those that have turned their back on God in rebellion against His law will receive the first plague, and it describes that first plague as a loathsome sore that came upon men. Men and women receive this loathsome sore, possibly like the boils of Job from head to toe, red, pussy, uh, filled with pain and anguish. Now, notice what they receive. The first plague is physical. It is a physical affliction upon the body. Now, what have those that have perpetrated the mark of the beast said? What have those that are proponents of the mark of the beast said? They said, either you take the mark of the beast or you cannot buy, you cannot sell, and will put you in prison, will physically harm you. So they say, for your physical protection, take the mark of the beast. And God says, those who take the mark of the beast will receive a physical plague boils. What irony, what a paradox. What's the spiritual lesson of the first plague? There is a lesson in every plague. The spiritual lesson of the first plague is this. The only physical security we have is in Christ. All of our physical security is in Jesus Christ. There is no physical security outside of Christ. These people turned their back on Jesus and His law. They took the mark of the beast. But there is only physical security in Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Only as we present our bodies as the temple of God and as a living sacrifice to Him can He protect the body in the time of trouble. So the message of the first plague is there's only physical security in Christ. Look at the second plague. Then the angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became the blood as of a dead man, and every living creature died in the sea. Can you imagine what would happen if every living creature died in the sea? Can you imagine the tremendous economic upheaval? How are most of this world's goods transported? What is the basis of international trade? It is the sea. Why is it that if the United States or any superpower wants to limit another power's economy, that it will make a naval blockade because the sea transports the major goods of the world, international trade, all the import and export goods, most of them come by sea. Here the Bible says that the sea becomes the blood of a dead man. In other words, there is an economic conflict, turmoil. The economy falls out. The bottom falls out of the economy. Look what Revelation chapter 18 says. Revelation 18 says this, verse 6. Render to her just as she rendered to you and repay her double to her works. She has lived gloriously and luxuriously, Revelation 18, verse 7. But now she says, I sit as a queen. I'm no widow, but I will see not sorrow. But her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she'll be burned with fire. 
In other words, this great wealth will go in one hour when the plagues come. Those that urge the mark of the beast say, unless you take the mark of the beast, you cannot buy or sell. And God's word says the very thing you promised you can't deliver because when the sea turns to blood, there's a great economic disaster. What does the second plague say? The second plague says all economic security is in Christ. Matthew 6, verse 33 says, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything will be added unto you. Philippians 4, verse 19 says, My God shall supply your very needs. Psalm says your bread and waters will be sure. Are you getting the message of the plagues? The first plague says all physical security is in Christ. Give him your body. The second plague says, all economic security is in Christ. Give him all of your possessions. The third plague, the Bible says in Revelation 16, verse 4, then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, you're righteous, O Lord, the one who is and was and who is to be because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. Why is blood given when they turn on their faucets? Why the rivers and waters become blood? Because they have said, your life is in our hands. We have power over your life. And there is nobody that has power over your life except God. In Him, Colossians 3, we live and move and have our being. So what does the third plague say? Our life is safe, hid with Christ in God. See, the first plague says all of your physical security is in Christ. Trust Him, your body. Second plague says all your economic security is in Christ. Trust Him with your finances, your possessions. The third plague says the only safety is if your life is hid with Christ in God because any human that says they can protect your life can't do it anyway. He is the one that gives us every breath. He's the one that makes every heart beat. Fourth plague. See, these are literal plagues, but they come for spiritual reasons. Literal plagues come for spiritual reasons. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. The sun scorches them. Down through the ages, the sun has been the object of worship. The Egyptians worshiped amun Ray, the sun god. The Babylonians worship Bel Marduk, the sun god. The Medes and Persians worship Mithra, the sun god. The Romans worshiped at times the sun god. And sun god worship has come into the church in the early days of Christianity. The Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday. And the Bible teaches that it will all be passed enforcing Sunday worship just at the time of the end. That God's Sabbath, His true Sabbath, that was changed by man and not by God, would be desecrated. And my brother, my sister, the Bible says that men and women receive the fourth plague because they've turned their back on the Creator and one of the objects of creation brings to earth great famine. See, what's the fourth plague say? All true worship is in Christ. What's the fourth plague say? Worship the Creator. So the objects of his creation which you have worshipped will not consume you. The fourth plague simply says that the creator is greater than the creation. That's a call to worship the creator. Fifth plague, verse 10, the fifth angel poured out his bull on the throne of the beast and the kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. The Fifth plague has to do with darkness on the seat of the beast. They have looked to the beast for light. What's the fifth plague say? There is light only in Christ. There is nothing outside of Jesus that can give you light. John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Psalm 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a what? Light unto my path. Jesus says in John 12, verse 35, Walk while you have the what? Light. Psalm says, Thy law is a light. So Jesus invites us to follow him for light. Don't follow tradition for light. Don't follow the teachings of men for light. Don't follow the books of earthly authors for light. Jesus is your light. The scriptures are full of truth. What does the first plague say? Only physical security in Christ. Give him your body. What's the second plague?